is Jesus the Messiah. The word Mashiach means king anointed by oil. There is plenty of Mashiachs. King David was Mashiach, king anointed by oil. Solomon was a Mashiach, king anointed by oil. There was many Mashiachs. There is verses within the Tanakh, mainly within the prophets, talking about Ha Mashiach. Now Ha Mashiach is the Mashiach that we are waiting for and that we are praying for every day. There is some misconceptions about what this Mashiach must actually do. Number one, he must rebuild the temple. Jesus certainly did not rebuild the temple. Now Christians would tell you that Jesus rebuilt the spiritual temple. Unfortunately, our Mashiach must build a physical temple, a house for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just as Solomon did in his time. The second duty of HaMashiach, which is very easy to spot, is world peace. This is mentioned by the prophet Micha, chapter number 4, as well as in Isaiah, chapter number 2. And nation shall not rise against nation, and they shall know war no more. Jesus apparently lived 2,000 years ago. I don't want to tell you what happened in the last 2,000 years, but there was plenty of war, unfortunately. And thus, Jesus cannot be Ha Mashiach. Christians will tell you he will do it all when he comes back on his second coming. There is nothing within the prophets or in the complete Tanakh that talks about the Mashiach coming twice. The Mashiach must do everything in a single coming. He must fulfill every single prophecy within the Tanakh to be Ha Mashiach. Ha Mashiach will not be God. He will not be God in the flesh. He will not be God at all. He will be a king of Israel like David and Solomon. He will do great things through God, but he will not be God. We will most certainly not pray to Mashiach. We only pray to the one God. The third thing, just as a side note, the Mashiach must come from the line of David. Actually, the verse states that he must come from the seed of Jesse, meaning he must be a direct offspring of Jesse. If you are born by a Jewish mother, you are Jewish, but you do not carry the tribe name of your mother. If your father is Jewish, you carry the tribe name of your father, and thus you are a descendant of your father. Most Christians would tell you Jesus had a miraculous birth and he had no father. They say that Joseph, his adopted father, can trace his line back to Jesse. I'll give you a quick example. The Cohens are direct descendants from Aaron. The Cohens have certain privileges within Judaism. They do the blessing of the people. If a Cohen were to adopt a Jewish child, a male child, that child cannot perform any of the rituals because he is an adopted child. Thus, even if Jesus was adopted by Joseph, who apparently can trace his line back to Jesse, he is still not from the seed of Joseph, and thus he cannot trace his line back to Jesse, which means he is not Ha Mashiach. Christians would say, but what about all the miracles that Jesus performed? That surely must make him the Mashiach. The Mashiach is not recognized by the miracles. Like I said, if there's world peace, if he rebuilds the temple, if he can trace his line back to Jesse, then there's still a few other things to do, then he could be Mashiach. But miracles alone doesn't make him Mashiach. If we were going by the Christian theory that miracles performed makes you Mashiach, then we must ask ourselves this question. Why was Moshe Robainu not HaMashiach? Moshe Robainu did more miracles than anyone mentioned within the Tanakh. He split the sea. He led the Jews out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. He did great things. 
but he's not Hamashiach. Christians would tell you, but Jesus resurrected someone from the dead. That means he must be either God, Chas Shalom, or he must be Hamashiach. I'll give you a few other prophets, which we do not pray to, Baruch Hashem, that did something either the same or even better than Jesus. The question is now, are you going to start Chas Shalom praying to these prophets? The first example is in Kings 1, chapter 17, where Elijah, the prophet, raises a widow's son back to life. Great miracle. The prophets all did miracles, but we do not, Chas Shalom, pray to them or worship them. My second example is even better. The prophet Ezekiel, in chapter 37, raises a complete town from dry bones back to life. That is a proper miracle. Yet we do not pray to Ezekiel. We as Jews recognize that many of the prophets could do miracles. Many of the rabbis even in the time of Jesus did great miracles. But we definitely do not worship them. Nothing they say can overwrite the Holy Torah. Nothing. The fourth thing that many Christians bring is that the covenant was re-established with Jesus. And that the old covenant was forgotten or expired because of the Jews sinning. The Torah, however, clearly states that the covenant is everlasting. That means it is eternal. It has no end, no end whatsoever. No new covenant, only the same covenant that was established with Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. That is written in the Torah. Not a vague word from a prophet. In the Torah direct, God speaking straight to the Jewish people, to Abraham, saying, I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Who must I believe? God speaking directly or a mistranslation of a translation of a translation of a prophet that could have said that there is a new covenant. The fifth thing that Christians would say is that how can you atone for your sins because the temple and the sacrifices is no longer in place? Well, on that point, HaMashiach must rebuild the temple so that the sacrifices can return and we can worship God as in days of old. But HaMashiach has not yet come. So until then, what do we do? As Jews, are we forsaken with sin? Something that these Christians would not tell you is that the sacrifices, most of them, was for unintentional sins. Not intentional sins. Christian would tell you, yeah, but you need the blood. The blood is what will save you. They are obviously saying the blood of Jesus. We'll get to that a little bit later. First, in the same text that lists the offerings, it also tells you that you could bring a grain offering. Now grain, just so that you know, does not bleed. No blood from grain. Yet, that atones for your sins. Also, after the destruction of the first and the second temple, the prophet Hosea in chapter 14 says, We will offer words of our lips instead of calves for our sin offerings. The other problem that Christians have with Jesus' blood atoning for their sins is that God in the Torah clearly prohibited child sacrifice or human sacrifice. That is God speaking directly within the Torah to the Jewish people saying that you cannot sacrifice a human. It also states that no man shall die for another man's sins. This is how Jews atone for our sins. We make Teshuvah. Now Teshuvah is to return. We tell Hashem, 
we are sorry about what we did, actively trying not to repeat that sin, chas v'shalom, the door for teshuvah is always open. And then obviously, as stated in the Torah, Yom Kippur atones for all sins. The sixth item that Christians might bring to you is, yes, but look at the prophets. They clearly speak about Jesus and Jesus is coming. He must be the Mashiach. Now, let's discuss some of the most quoted texts within the Tanakh, mainly within the Nevi'im, the prophets. Remember that these prophets spoke vaguely and they spoke to the people at their time within their time. Another thing to keep in mind is that Christians unfortunately are reading an English Old Testament which was translated by Christian scribes from Hebrew. It has been translated many times. There is more versions of the Old Testament in their translations available than what I have time to mention in this video. They take those translations and bring it to you, showing to you how this points to their Mashiach. If you read it straight from the Tanakh, you'll see there's Hebrew there. You will often find that these Christian scribes to promote their agenda purposefully mistranslated words to fit their agenda. It is scary. It will shake your little world. Let's go to Isaiah 53. And it states, Hashem desired to oppress him and he afflicted him. Now Christians get all excited. Ooh, this could be Jesus. Then we read further. And his soul would acknowledge guilt. Now all Christians would tell you that Jesus was sinless, squeaky clean. Why does he have guilt? He would see offspring. All Christians know that Jesus had no children. This verse clearly says he will see his offspring. The word in Hebrew is his seed. We continue. And live long days. According to most accounts, Jesus died quite young at age 32, 33. There you have it. Isaiah 53 wrapping it up saying that this clearly doesn't point to Jesus. In fact, Isaiah 53 is speaking to Israel and to the Jewish nation. The whole book of Isaiah, as he said in the very first verse of the very first chapter, is that he's speaking to Judah and Jerusalem and the kings in his times. The second also very often quoted section is Psalm 22, which Christians call the suffering servant. Yeah, in this section is clear mistranslations. You'll see soon that a word that is often translated as they pierced my hands, which Christians love, does not exist in Hebrew. David is speaking mostly about himself and about Israel. There is no prophecy contained within David. David was not a prophet. That's why his book is contained in the section called Kituvim, Writings. Let's look at Psalm 22, at some extracts that clearly proves that this section, as the whole of Psalms, is dealing with King David and the battles he had with many of his enemies. In Psalm 22, it says, Many bulls surround me, Bashan's mighty ones encircle me. That was an army that was after King David. And now for the finale, Psalm 22 verse 17, the often mistranslated verse. For dogs have surrounded me, a pack of evildoers has enclosed me, like the prey of a lion are at my hands and my feet. Nothing about being pierced. This is again his enemies that is surrounding him. Now one of the most ridiculous verses quoted by Christians to point to their Messiah is most certainly Zechariah 9 verse 9. I will read it for you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
For behold, your king will come to you, righteous and victorious. Is he a humble man riding upon a donkey? All the Christians will get all excited. Say, yes, that's exactly what Jesus did. He rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. I hate to break this to you, but a donkey 2,000 years ago was the mode of transport. And there was thousands of Jews riding within Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. They are not all Mashiach. Last, but certainly not least, Christians would quote you all these things. They would quote you things from the prophets. They would quote you things from the writings like Psalms. They would quote you verses from everywhere. Whenever you give a Christian answer, he will never answer your question, but he will divert to another verse. That is because the Christians do not have the answers. They know their theology is complicated, misinformed, mistranslated, and makes no sense. Christians ignore something that is written in the Torah and in the Tanakh over and over and over again. Hear me, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Hear this now and take it to your heart that in the heavens above and the earth below there is none other. It also states that you should be careful not to stray, not to serve gods of others. You should have only one God, Hashem, never speaks about a three-in-one. The Trinity, in fact, is never mentioned within the entire Tanakh, including the New Testament. Never mentioned. Scary. I hope you found this video informative, and I hope this would help you with all the thousands of Christian missionaries out there. I hope you all have a great week. May you continue to grow in your journey. And if you're already a Jew, may you continue to grow and get closer to our Kadosh Baruch Hu. May we all see the final redemption and the coming of HaMashiach. Please, God, now. Oh.